All right, welcome back everyone. Today we're going to finish our journey through the history of the English language by getting as far as the present day. And uh, that means bringing us up to speed. We finished with the middle, uh, the early modern uh, English period, uh, which ended in 1700. And now we're going to go all the way up to now. At least that's the idea. So I'm gonna tell you once again about all of the aspects of this period of the language. So the spelling, the sounds, the morphology, the syntax, the lexicon, uh, and we'll end with a little bit on varieties of English and attitudes to English, including its different varieties. So what's going on during this period? Well, last time we saw the Renaissance. Uh, in the 18th century, we have the emergence of the uh, Enlightenment. Um, very crudely put, and there's a lot more to it than this, um, this is a period that's known as the Age of Reason. Uh, it's characterized um, by rationality, logic, science, uh, the emergence of these things. Um, and as part of this movement, we also see certain social and political changes uh, which may or may not seem like rational things to do, such as the American uh, independence move, um, as a British person, I have to say, I always thought this was a bad idea. I told them so at the time, um, but uh, they did it nonetheless. So the um, country of America emerges, which in some ways might be the single most important thing that's ever happened in the history of the English language. Because why is English a big world language today? It's certainly not because of little England, or at least not directly. In 1789, we have the French Revolution, a related movement um, one thing that you can actually ask yourselves is why there was never a comparable revolution in England. There were revolutionary movements, uh, but it never led, say, to the abolition of the monarchy um, or to the emergence of a completely new social and political order uh, like it did uh, in other countries. In 1807, we get the abolition of the slave trade by the British Parliament, uh, this was a big step forward as far as Britain was concerned. And again, uh, the former colonies did not follow suit until substantially later. In the 19th century, uh, at least again, as far as the traditional intellectual history is told, we have a swing towards Romanticism. Romanticism uh, is a movement in philosophy and in literature um, that focuses largely on the individual's emotional reaction to the world. Um, so uh, it, it has a highly individualistic focus um, and is also tied up with nationalism with the emergence of nation states during this period. So uh, the modern sort of view of the world in many ways emerges from the confluence of these two movements, the Enlightenment uh, and the Romantic uh, movement. Uh, partly, of course, Romanticism was a reaction to the Enlightenment. Partly, it was also a reaction to the Industrial Revolution because a lot of things start changing uh, the, the, the order of things during this period. We get, in the Industrial Revolution time, we get um, societies moving from a more agricultural to a more industrial basis, um, and that goes along with urbanization. So uh, people are moving away from the country, moving to cities, uh, cities are uh, ballooning in size during this period, um, and with that comes new challenges to solve. For instance, public health, um, which essentially emerges as a sort of a whole new way of thinking about things um, that only you only have to worry about when you have 50 people crammed into one tiny little house, um, which was fairly often the case uh, during these industrial revolution urbanization periods. Um, read, uh, for instance, Engels on the condition of the working classes in Britain uh, to see about that. Um, so we've got all of this going on, and, uh, and obviously the, the Romantics responding to it in their own way. As for the 20th century, um, I always like to think, I always like to say, well, you, you all know the 20th century, you were there, but the fact is you were probably babies mostly, so, um, and it gets more and more depressing that every year that becomes more and more the case. Um, nevertheless, what happened in the 20th century, in case you didn't know, um, there were some wars, and they were bad, right? And we don't want them to happen again. So, no wars. And um, 
We also get technological advancements. There's loads of stuff that emerges during the 20th century that wasn't there before. Um, modern means of transportation, uh, particular aviation. It starts to become possible to get pretty much anywhere in the world within the space of about 24 hours. Um, you can talk to people long distance, you get telephones, you get televisions, and towards the end of the period, of course, the internet as well. Uh, and all of this comes with, at least in uh, Western societies, a move towards a post-industrial way of living. So a way of living that was really, um, that was really, that's really not so much shaped by uh, the necessity to produce large amounts of stuff um, as to what it is shaped by, uh, I think we're all still collectively trying to figure that out. Um, but there we go, that's where we are now. And then, of course, in the 21st century, uh, we get all kinds of stupid shit happening, um, like Donald Trump. So, Who's writing during this period? Well, the short answer is, by now, pretty much everyone. Um, the literacy rate is um, damn near 100% uh, in most of the uh, Western societies, at, means, at least among moderately wealthy people. And uh, we have lots and lots of writers, not just literary writers, also political writers, historical writers, anything you can think of, of course. We're in the modern era now. So in the 18th century, you can see um, we've got uh, Isaac Newton, um, we've got people, scientists like Isaac Newton, Joseph Priestley, um, we've got poets, we've got Burns, um, people like uh, Jonathan Swift, we've got political philosophers like Adam Smith, Thomas Paine, um, we've got uh, Byron and Shelley, we've got the emergence of um, the, uh, the, uh, the Gothic uh, in particular, I think, during the 18th and 19th. Um, and uh, in the 19th century, um, there are loads and loads of, uh, of famous authors, um, possibly more famous authors from this period than any other, at least as far as the UK is concerned. Um, and so there are the Bronte sisters, Dickens, uh, all these people who you, of course, know about. Um, again, lots of writers who were not writing uh, fiction. Um, so Darwin, for instance, um, Descent of Man, Origin of Species, same period, and many other scientific texts from this same time. 20th century, hardly need to name them. Um, but uh, all kinds of people who fundamentally uh, whether scientifically or literarily or whatever, philosophically have shaped the way that we see things today. Um, going from uh, Orwell to James Baldwin to Alice Walker and J.K. Rowling. The, uh, the material here is enormous. We have vast amounts of stuff to work with from all genres that are imaginable. Any questions? All right, um, as far as the sounds and spelling of the language are concerned, there's nothing that's gonna trip you up overly much because this is what you already know. This is the language of today, essentially. Even by 1700, modern English spelling is already mostly fixed. By 1700, the things like the Latin S and the U and V distribution are starting to stabilize into the form that we see uh, today. There are still some things that are unusual from a modern perspective, so the capitalization of nouns and adjectives wasn't completely fixed by this point. Um, the modern convention, obviously, is to capitalize proper names and to capitalize at the beginning of the sentence, but basically not to capitalize anything else. And, of course, um, in these earlier texts, we see different things, so we see all kinds of things. By 1850, um, the standardization of spelling is complete. And um, the variant spellings, so when you read, for instance, uh, Dickens or Austin or the Brontes, you can read them in the form in which they're originally written, and there will be almost nothing that stands out to you spelling-wise as being unusual from this period. Um, of course, there are still variant spellings today. Um, so in uh, British English, we, words like labor and color, we have an O-U-R, and in American English, there is just O-R. Uh, there is eyes versus eyes with a Z in the spelling versus with an S in the spelling. Um, the Z variant is ubiquitous in the United States, and in Britain, people use both. People use the S or the Z. Uh, and then, uh, of course, one of the things that's driving this process, this goes back to what we were saying about standardization at the end of last time, um, is that... Uh, Dictionaries start to emerge, 
and these really drive this process. And in, this, in the 18th century, we see the big important dictionaries that lay the foundation for what's going to come, the, the ones that really are actively standardizing the language. Um, so in America, it was Webster's Dictionary, 1783. This plays a very, very important role in the coalescence, the understanding. If you look at the timing here, 1783, this is just after the Declaration of Independence. This is just after, a few years after um, the American uh, independent, the Wars of Independence and the, and the emergence of America as a country. And with that comes this kind of sense of national identity. And with that comes this idea that we should have our own way of writing things. We should have our own dictionaries. So Webster is central to all of that. And Webster's is still taken as kind of totemic uh, in America as a, as a dictionary, um, much as the Oxford English Dictionary is taken in Britain. We'll come back to dictionaries later on. Now, um, this isn't to say that, uh, that, that people haven't tried to change the spelling since then. People have tried. As late as 1949, um, Mont Follick, who was an MP in the British Labour Party, uh, brought a proposal to the British Parliament um, to change English spelling. And what he wanted to change it to was this. Right? This that's in the top right-hand corner, this is what he calls new spelling. And um, this actually, um, it looks really flipping weird, but actually when you learn how it works, it's got a cool property, which is that the graphemes map onto the phonemes much, much more regularly than they do in the standard English orthography. So although this looks weird, there are advantages to it. And uh, Mont Follick was, was very aware of those. Unfortunately, um, his bill was not successful. And even if it had been, you might wonder what the effects would be worldwide. Now, uh, recent world events have shown that the British Parliament has an inflated sense of its own self-importance. Um, but even, even they, I think, wouldn't now lay claim to ownership of the English language. Right? If Britain says, we're going to use this spelling, and then they say, they go across the, across the Atlantic and say, hey, Donald, We've decided to use this, we've decided to spell things like this now. And, and, and we want you to do the same thing, right? Because we've got a special relationship going on here. Um, you can probably imagine uh, how the Donald would react. So um, this spelling reform uh, was not successful, and it's hard to imagine any spelling reform being successful in the modern era, precisely because of how widespread English has become, and how familiar to how many millions and billions of people our, our normal, uh, messy, messed up spelling system actually is. Another thing that happens during this period, um, spelling obviously becomes a major uh, point of uh, a major point of pride, a point of importance. Um, these uh, later on you get spelling bees developing uh, where you uh, start uh, testing how good small children are at spelling things. Um, and so obviously this is, this is an important skill, perceived as an important skill to have. Uh, people who can't spell properly are socially evaluated, they're judged. Um, pronunciation also becomes a very important issue. So um, people are very concerned with how they sound during this period. It's not that they weren't concerned with that at all before, um, but this, during the uh, 18th century onwards, there's a, this becomes, at least in Britain, a kind of national obsession. How do, you, how do you correctly pronounce things? How do you pronounce things like the best people pronounce things? And um, you get the rather gloriously named Grand Repository of the English Language um, by Spence in 1775. And uh, this is like any other dictionary, but with one important addition, they put in the pronunciation in brackets after the head word. So not just the spelling, they've attempted to use some sort of semi-phonetic notation uh, to put in how this, these words are actually pronounced. Um, not just how they are pronounced, uh, more how they should be pronounced, or how they should be pronounced if you want to sound like uh, a member of high society, at least. Now, the extent to which this is embedded in British culture is probably best represented by George Bernard Shaw's play um, Pygmalion. Um, and um, in this uh, play, which was also made into a musical, um, My Fair Lady, um, the 
the plot of this, of this, not to give too much away, is about a professor of phonetics um, who is actually, who's training a Cockney girl, so a girl from uh, the East End of London, to speak standard English. Basically, this is, he starts out, this is a kind of, de uh, kind of dare for him. He says, I bet I can do this. I bet I can train this girl to speak proper. And, um, and so that's what he does. Um, and um, interestingly, this, this, this isn't just sort of a fantasy story. This kind of thing was actually going on at the time. And, uh, and people like uh, Bernard Shaw were, were very aware of this. Um, he says it's impossible uh, for an Englishman to open his mouth without making some other Englishman despise him, um, which I think is probably still true today. Um, and, um, and Shaw was actually quite aware of what was going on in, the, in, in linguistics at the time as well. So the char this character actually, um, uh, Henry Higgins, um, not Henry, what's his name? Is that his name? Um, yeah, the, the professor, um, he's actually modeled after um, an actual phonetician and historian of the English language, Henry Sweet, um, who's quite a famous figure in the, in the history of English. Um, one of the major points of, of spelling variation is the pronunciation of initial H. So this is something that varies quite substantially across different varieties, um, and therefore uh, you would get people practicing saying sentences like this in order to, to, to practice their getting their H's right. Um, so um, this sentence um, would read, in Hampshire, Hereford, and, uh, and Hartford, hurricanes hardly ever happen. And... Uh, uh, there are many varieties where all of those H's would be left off, um, particularly the, um, the Cockney dialect that Eliza um, is speaking at the start of the play. Um, one thing that happens when you get people to do this from those dialects is they actually overcorrect, um, and they say things like, hurricanes hardly ever happen, right? Where they put a H on the ever as well, um, because essentially um, it's, it's not present in their variety, so they just hypercorrect to inserting it in any vowel initial environment. So this is something that is happening um, during this, this period. People care a lot about their pronunciation. People are going crazy about it. During the 19th and 20th centuries, it's generally said that regional varieties lose some of their distinctive features. And this is partly why this process of, of standardization of linguistic anxiety, um, linguistic paranoia, um, and there are variables here, some of which are stigmatized, some of which aren't. You can listen online if you want. You can go to this website, and um, there's all kinds of different sound recordings of early 20th century dialects or mid 20th century dialects and how they sounded. A lot of these you actually don't really hear in the wild anymore. It's very rare, um, for instance, to hear um, something like um, a, uh, something like a, uh, well, um, for instance, a, uh, an accent, the accent, the rural accents from places like Somerset. Um, you will not really hear them all that much unless you go to the places where they were originally spoken. And even then, it's not always that easy to find people who speak like that, or who are willing to speak like that with outsiders. Uh, so some of the variables we've got here. Um, in words like night, one of the things we've talked about before is that night loses this consonant, right? It's, it's, it used to be something like nicht, and this ch sound gets deleted. Uh, and in some varieties, it remains. Um, so in some traditional northern varieties, it's still there. Um, this is not really a stigmatized variety. It's just a little known variety. Um, another northern variety, um, which is a bit more stigmatized, um, is the retention of an oo in words like uh, cow and house, so ku and hoos. Um, and particularly, these nowadays, I think, are associated with Scots more than anything else. Um, one of them we've already seen, initial fricative voicing, which we get as early as Middle English, is something that we find retained in the dialects of the South. Um, so for further and see, we would have pronunciations like further and z, 
And um, as we've seen last time, this was something that people were quite aware of, uh, and there was some stigma attached to it for quite some time. Um, we also find um, the long O of standard English being pronounced as an A, ah, again in some northern varieties. Again, this is most robustly attested for Scots now, um, but you do find it in traditional dialects of other areas as well. So ham and twa, rather than home and to. The other interesting thing that happens during this period is uh, the development of the sound which I pronounce as R. Um, but the fact that I pronounce it as R, which is pretty much a pure vowel, is indicative of just how crazy this sound has become. Um, so in the late 16th century, this is very early, right? This is in the early modern English period. Post-vocalic R is weakened and lost, but not everywhere. It happens in London, it happens in much of England, but it doesn't happen in Scotland, it doesn't happen in the Southwest, uh, and it doesn't happen, crucially, in most of the varieties that were to become the input for the formation of American English. So when American English emerges, it, it emerges from dialects where the R sound is still retained in post-vocalic position. And that's why most American dialects have this R today. Um, so this, this post-vocalic R um, in words like car or car, um, this R, I have to try quite hard to produce this sound, hard to produce this sound. It's not an easy one for me. Um, this thing uh, is mostly, uh, what's interesting about it is that the prestige varieties differ. Um, so uh, in British English, the variety without the R is the prestigious one, and the varieties with it are non-prestigious. Um, and uh, in the US, I believe it's mostly the other way round. Um, so pronouncing the R is the more standard-like, formal-like variant. Um, so that, but there is a lot of variability here. And as you'd imagine, whenever a linguistic variable is socially evaluated, that social evaluation can change. It doesn't always stay constant. We'll see another example of that later on. There's something here, um, there's one environment in which the R is not lost. So in a word like tuner, as in a piano tuner, um, or here we've got uh, a tuner ramp. So here, um, this is a tuner uh, written like this, right, which is something or someone that does tuning. And then there's another one, this, um, which is a tunefish, right? For me, these are the same. Pronounce them exactly the same, tuner. But if you have something after the, um, if you have something after the uh, vowel, if you have two vowels next to each other, as in the case of these two words, this would be, on its own, this would be tuna, on this would be amp. If I say them together, it would be a tuner amp. So the r comes back, or rather it's preserved, in this particular context. Um, and that's quite, this is something, this is called linking R. It's the R that you find um, where there would historically be an R, and it emerges in this vowel initial context. Um, but um, you also find something called intrusive R, and it's called intrusive R because this R is an intruder. It is coming in where it is, was never historically motivated. Um, so if I want to talk about something like, um, oh, what can I say? If I want to say this, tuner emerges, the R appears, even though this is a word that historically never had an R in the first place. Right? And that, this is completely uh, ubiquitous. Um, and there's more examples on the slide. Uh, law and order. Right. L this word law never historically had an R, but when it's followed with an and, it becomes law -ren. Uh Saw a film, not saw a film, saw a film with a R. And if you want to say uh, something about a dessert with banana in it, it has banana in it. And I'm slightly overdoing it here 
um, with these examples, but this is a honest-to-God feature of present-day British English. You have this special intrusive R uh, that crops up whenever you would otherwise have two vowels, right? So whether you, where you would have a hiatus between two vowels, saw a film, banana in it. And this, is, this is quite a special feature um, of the modern-day language. Um, if you do phonology, you'll find out more about it. It actually, I think, tells you quite a lot about how things are phonologically represented, potentially. So these linking R and intrusive R uh, are useful things to know, uh, also for the purposes of the exam, hint, hint. Any questions? So, morphology, what's going on in Model English morphology? Well, the basic answer is not a whole lot, right? Old English had a load of morphology, most of it's gone by now, not all of it. Some of it is still there, but what is still there is used in weird and unpredictable ways. So, in particular, pronouns. Um, pronouns, if, if you think of um, pronouns like we and us and I and me as being nominative and accusative pairs, which is how they're traditionally seen, you might wonder what's going on in examples like these. Us London lawyers don't often get an out. This us is being used in subject position. So historically, at least, it should be we London lawyers. Then you've got um, an ellipsis case, Harriet in Joan, Jane Austen's Emma, they are quite as well educated as me. And here, this uh, should prescriptively be, they are quite as well educated as I. And in this case, because Jane Austen's smart and Dickens is also is smart, these, these guys probably know that this is a somewhat stigmatized feature. Nevertheless, it's actually found very systematically throughout the history of English. Um, and um, it, even in, uh, in Shakespeare, um, you get examples like in Merchant of Venice, all debts are clear between you and I. What's wrong with this? Right, in German it would be a dative. Um, in, uh, because it's a complement to the preposition in English, it would be... Um, the object, basically, some object case, whatever you want to call it, um, so you would expect it to be me, between you and me. Um, but instead you find between you and I, and this is a very, very common feature. Um, so it seems like there's something weird going on with pronouns uh, in the modern English language. Here's an example from Othello. You have seen Othello and she together. Same deal, right? This is the direct object of the verb to see, we wouldn't expect a nominative pronoun here, but there it is. So it seems like when you get pronouns in certain environments, they take the wrong case or some weird case. And, um, and this is a very productive pro property of, uh, of present day English. Um, it seems that um, there's actually a, a fairly good generalization that governs uh, but for subjects at least, when you do and don't find uh, accusative case. Because examples like, I have seen she, that's really bad. Right? I have seen she is ungrammatical in pretty much every variety of English. Similarly, me have seen her, or me has seen her. Awful. These don't make any sense. You can't do that. So, why not? What's the generalization? Um, well, uh, again, if you've done some syntax, um, then you can say uh, that the, the time which you get the nominative pronouns um, is in the specifier position of TP, or you might call this thing IP. It means the same thing when it's unmodified. And when it's modified or when it's in a different position, um, it can take, um, it can do all kinds of other things. Um, if you haven't done any syntax, um, don't particularly worry about this. This is just a neat way of explaining the generalization that you find. So, um, in terms of uh, modern English, you get unexpected cases occurring in certain environments. Typically cases um, with a slightly unusual syntactic structure, um, like coordination, you and I, um, or ellipsis, like as well-educated as me, 
And some of these, in some of these cases, it's actually virtually ungrammatical to use the prescriptively correct, correct form. Um, so uh, if someone, if you, get a, if you knock on someone's door and the person says, who's there? And you respond, it is I, right? You will sound like some sort of cliche out of the 15th century, right? It is I, you have to say, it is me. So these, and technically again, that's, that's weird because this is a copular environment. You might expect this copular environment to have, an, uh, to have a nominative pronoun. Um, but, but no, but no. Just another way in which what little morphology there is left in the English language still manages to screw with your head. That's what we're here for. All right, what else do you get going on? Verbal agreements, ain't. The form ain't uh, is very commonly found in the 18th century. It's older than that, but this is where it really uh, ramps up in frequency. Today, this form is stigmatized, fairly non-standard, uh, but many, many varieties, both of British English and American English, still use this. Um, so you will find ain't, and ain't uh, is, replaces pretty much all forms of to be in the negative. So I ain't, he ain't, they ain't. Um, it's a very morphologically invariant form. Uh, so it's actually quite useful in this regard um, because you don't have to mess around with he isn't, um, I, you aren't, I, you can't even say it, right? There is, there's a gap there and that's interesting. You might want to ask why in English Does this form not exist? Amant. Now, interestingly, it actually does, but only in Scottish varieties and Northern Irish varieties. So they're, they're, those people are perfectly happy saying, I amant here, or something like that. Everyone else, um, you really have to rephrase it in some way. You have to say, I'm not here. Right? You have to criticize the verb, and you can't criticize the nt suffix to the verb. Um, and that is really quite a strange property of English. Why is it there? Again, it's English morphology, it's just there to mess with your head. Right? Um, and you can read around about this, but no one actually has a good solution. This is something that's very badly understood. Why do we not have this? Many varieties do something else with their verbal paradigm, which is that they regularize it. Um, so in the standards, if you think about the modern standards uh, verb paradigm, you would have I walk, you walk, they walk, we walk, you plural walk, but he, she, it walks with a s on the end. And uh, this uh, only in the third person singular is a pretty crummy verbal paradigm. And so many varieties do something different with it, which is that they regularize. East Anglia just gets rid of the S. Um, so in East Anglia, um, you see uh, the S just disappearing entirely. So you get she walk, he walk, it walk. Um, in the North and the Southwest, in certain contexts, you get the opposite pattern emerging, which is that the S gets generalized to every single ending. So I walks, you walks, and so on. Um, again, you don't, people don't use this completely categorically, but you find that the S is more widely used in these varieties. And you can kind of see why in a certain sense, because um, the modern English S ending is not a hugely functional piece of morphology by anyone's standards. The other thing that happens that's crucial during this period um, is that strong verbs continue to become weak. And this is a development that has accompanied us throughout the entire history of the language. So we have things like um, a verb like abide, which means to, to live or to, uh, to, to endure. Um, this verb, um, the past tense used to be abode, uh, but this becomes regularized to abided in both the past participle and the finite past form. And this is true of many other verbs as well. So you get this development where strong verbs continue to get weakened. Occasionally, the opposite happens, but the most, the common direction of movement from Old English up until the present day is from strong to weak. Okay, the subjunctive then. Um, you may recall that in Old and Middle English, there was a subjunctive mood. And the subjunctive mood 
um, is basically used to express an unreal situation. It looks a bit like the conjunctive in German, but it's not quite the same in terms of the semantic situations in which you would use it. So in, in Old Middle English, it has this irrealis flavor to it, which means it's used to express an unreal situation, something that isn't the case right now, but that you wish would happen, that you hope would happen, that could have happened, that should have happened, or that might still happen, but is not the case yet. So this unreal situation often uses the subjunctive. So here you have an example. Ich wille that du forjete. I want that you forget. And this forjete, um, what ending would you expect to see here? Does anyone know what ending you would expect to see on this verb forjete, if it was in the indicative? Right, yeah, so this thu, remember this thu is just like German du, right? So what ending do you expect with a German du? You expect this st ending. And that's exactly what you would expect in the indicative in Old and Middle English as well. Thu for je test. But because it's an irrealis situation, what we instead find is this subjunctive ending, which is just an e. And the subjunctive endings in general are shorter than the endings that you see in, it, they're either the same length or they're shorter than the endings you see in the indicative. And so it's perhaps not a surprise that in modern English the subjunctive has basically disappeared. In fact, it doesn't really make sense, and that's what the bottom line is here, it doesn't really make sense to talk about a subjunctive in modern English anymore. At least insofar as there is no distinct set of forms here. And in fact, mostly um, when there is a subjunctive, so the, the, the subjunctive would be something like this. It is important that he leave. You can still say that. Um, it sounds a bit like you've got a stick up your ass if you do. Right? Most of the time, what you would say is something like this. It is important that he should leave. Or, it, I want, or a to form, you say, it's important to leave for him. Or something like that. Right? These subjunctive forms with a bare verb like this are a bit archaic. Moreover... There's nothing special about this form, right? This is just an infinitive form. So there's no real reason to say that the subjunctive exists in modern English. It's just another uh, use of a bare form of the verb in certain contexts. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Syntax then. Modern English syntax. Um, something that we've seen already is that the number of auxiliaries used increases. Remember that Old English has more in the way of verbal morphology. It has more that it can do, that it can do um, with verbal, individual verbal forms, or some of these nuances of meaning are just left unexpressed. So in Old English, it's perfectly possible um, to have a future tense that's expressed by means of the simple present verb forms, or the non-past verb forms, as it's perhaps better to call them. And this is something uh, that you can also do in present-day German, right? So something like, ich mache es morgen, right. I'll do it tomorrow, right? No special marking on the verb, you've just got a normal present tense verb, and then the adverbial gives you all of the information you need in order to give you the temporal reference. But modern English likes auxiliaries, and it likes auxiliaries so much that you can stack them up like this example here. Um, he might have been being seen. Um, and here we've got uh, lots of different things. Um, we've got a modal, we've got a perfect auxiliary, we've got a progressive auxiliary, we've got a passive auxiliary, and then we've got a past participle. And we can stack them all up in one sentence like this. This is not something that we find in Old English, not even close. Another thing that we find during this period is that new modals are introduced into the grammar, or rather quasi-modals, because these modals that we get during this period are not proper modals. They don't display the other properties of modern uh, English modals. Um, they don't uh, behave, show the so-called nice properties uh, that are sometimes discussed. You can't invert them, for instance. Um, but they function much the same. So forms like gotta, gonna, have to, wanna, you don't write these things down, right? The standard spelling does not represent them at all, um, but they're extremely productively used in speech. So pretty much everyone uses them, even in high register speech. 
Um, now, going to is first used with a clear future tense meaning as early as 1482. So this is the very end of the Middle English period. Um, and this increases in frequency throughout the modern period. Um, the written form, as I've said, is still non-standard. You also get a new passive at this point, um, the get passive. Um, so in a sentence like got knocked out, um, you've got uh, here, this, this again is first attested at the beginning of the modern period, 1562. It's still becoming more and more frequent. And in many cases where you would expect to be passive, uh, speakers of modern English um, will use this get passive. Traditionally, um, it started out, it's said to start out as an adversative passive. It's something that happens with bad effects, right? So getting knocked out is not a good thing, usually. So you get knocked out, um, that's a bad thing. Um, it's, it's certainly not that anymore. You can also say something like, I got paid, right? And getting paid is usually assumed to be a good thing at least in modern Western societies. Uh, don't want to overgeneralize there. So you can get knocked out, you can get paid. Um, this starts out um, at this point as a more eventive passive. And for older speakers of English, it's really only an eventive passive. You can't use it um, statively. Uh, but in the present day language, you actually can. So um, you can say something like, I got stuck in traffic for over an hour. Right? Now, because this has a duration, that means that what you're dealing with here is a real state, right? something that held for a continuous period of time, which means that it can't be a pure event. It has to be a state. And it seems like the get passive can now be used in this context, at least by younger speakers uh, and by more permissive speakers. So the get passive uh, with get as a kind of passive auxiliary is on the increase. Another passive that emerges during this time is the so-called progressive passive. And um, the progressive passive isn't called the progressive passive because it's particularly like left wing uh, or anything like that. Um, it's progressive passive because it's got an ing form in it. So here you've got this being. Right? His tooth was being pulled out by a barber. Earlier, you actually find a different form here. You wouldn't use, in the earlier form, you wouldn't use this. You would use a passive, uh, uh, you would use what's called a uh, passival form, which is this uh, here. His tooth was pulling out. This seems really weird to a modern speaker of English, right? Um, if you were to say, my house is being built, you wouldn't say that. You would say, my house is building, right? Mein Haus ist am Bauen. Can you say that? No? Yes? No. Okay. Right. So this is the kind of thing, right? Um, meine Zähne sind am rausziehen, or something. This is weird, right? Um, so these, these progressive passives um, are something that develops during the 18th and 19th century. You get the first examples at the end of the 18th century, and in the 19th century, this really kicks off. Um, and it's fu the funny thing is, you can tell that it kicks off because remember, we're in the era of prescriptivism now. We get to the, with, this is the point where the language is standardized. People care, and people care so, so much that whenever they see one of these progressive passives, they have to write an angry letter to the newspaper about it and say, stupid kids these days are using these being forms all over the place. What's with that? They're so lame and uncouth. And um, so people in the, in the 19th century really, really didn't like this form, um, which it makes it all the more surprising that in the modern language it is completely unmarked, right? No one would judge you for using a sentence like this one at the top. There is no reason to. It's a perfectly fine, cromulent sentence, right? According to anyone who you might ask. Um, what's interesting about the progressive passive, though, is that many of the early examples of the progressive passive come from a particular group of poets. Um, and these are the uh, lake circle of poets, including quite famous poets like uh, Coleridge, uh, Robert Southey, and William Wordsworth. And these poets particularly like the progressive passive. And it's been suggested, so you can read Pratt and Denison if you're interested, um, that these people, these poets, who were a very specific group of people, that they were really keen on using the progressive passive basically to annoy old people. 
That was their purpose here, right? These are young, very sort of revolutionary writers. Revolutionary I use in the literal sense. They were very sympathetic with revolutionary France. Right? So when the French Revolution was happening, they were in Britain, they were saying, ah, oh, why can't we have a revolution over here as well? Um, but they didn't, so instead, they're just like, let's passive aggressively, see what I did there, use the progressive passive to annoy all of the older writers who think that this is uncouth. So that's the idea. There's a kind of sociolinguistic motivation for use of this form. Obviously, sometimes telling people not to use a particular linguistic form has the opposite effect from what you want. You'll just get people to use it more just to annoy you. Okay, here's a slide that's got probably too much text on it, but uh, let's roll with it anyway. This is a slide about relative clauses. And in modern English, as you know, relative clauses can be formed in more than one way. So you can say, the book that I read, the book which I read. You can also say, the book I read, with nothing introducing the relative clause, right? You can say, the person that I met, the person who I met, the person whom I met, or the person I met. All of these are fine. So there's many different ways of forming relative clauses um, in, uh, in English. We're focusing here on restrictive relatives. So I'm going to leave aside non-restrictive relatives, which is this kind of relative clause that adds extra information. So Jane Austen, comma, whose sentences were used above, comma, was a modern English writer. This kind of relative is a restrictive relative. So we're going to leave that aside. They work a little bit differently. Um, but the preference for restrictive relatives, which are like these ones, these first two, the book, the, the book I read, the person I met, the preference is to use that or even zero. So you would normally expect to see that or zero in this type of relative clause. Prescriptive rules, however, favor use of the WH forms. Um, so you would ask, people would traditionally um, use the, um, uh, the WH forms here. Um, and this is particularly true with humans. Right. So if you ask a prescriptivist, if you look in a prescriptive grammar, it will say, you shouldn't say the person that I met. You should say the person whom I met. Or, okay, even if you're not a, who, a whom person, who, the person who I met. Um, so the prescriptive rules favor the WH forms um, with human heads. And when I say human heads, I don't mean like disembodied heads, right? I mean human people who are functioning as the head of the relative clause grammatically, the grammatical head. Um, interestingly, um, if preposition stranding is banned, that also favors the WH forms, because, um, the, uh, the, it, because some, some of the relative clause forms cannot be used with prepositions. So you can say the book that I read about, the book which I read about, the book I read about, but you can't say, the book about that I read, or the book about I read. But you can say the book about which I read. So if you don't do preposition stranding, um, and, uh, if, and that's something that is, um, that is sort of disfavored, I think we might come to that. Did we talk about that last time, preposition stranding? Man, my memory is really short these days. Um, okay, so you know what preposition stranding is, good. Uh, if you don't, watch the video from last week or read the book, you know, that's an option too. Um, so, preposition stranding, uh, if you have preposition stranding, uh, then you can use that or which or whatever. If you don't have preposition stranding, that favors the WH forms. But actually, if you look at usage, um, what you generally find is that people prefer the that form uh, or the zero form. So these are, this is a corpus of professional spoken American. Um, so this is not low register, this is high register speech. And they use that 80%, more than 80% of the time in a, in a corpus. Um, so there's quite a lot of use of these forms. You can read more about this in the textbook uh, if you don't understand anything. Here's a fun one to end with uh, for the syntax section, quotative like. Um, now this development uh, is one in which a preposition or something like a preposition, like, becomes a marker of reported speech or reported thought. Um, so here the examples are something like, and I'm like, you know, I don't think so, or she was like, ah. And um, this is, these examples, are interesting because 
the traditional way of expressing these would be something like, um, and I said, I don't think so, or I reacted in the following way, like, I don't think so. Um, but um, we can use like in the modern language. This is something that's actually spread mostly during the second half of the 20th century. It's sometimes said to originate in the US, particularly uh, in the east coast of the US, uh, but it's probably a bit more complicated than that. Um, and in any case, now you get it everywhere. So you get British people using this very extensively as well. Um, there are studies of this, if you don't believe me. And if you want to follow up on this, um, this book, um, Teen Talk, uh, by Tagliamonte 2016, uh, is very, very interesting in this regard. She, goes, uh, she looks at a lot of features of, that are conventionally associated with teenage language uh, and looks at how they're used and their roots and that kind of thing. I did a little audio interview with her, so you can go and listen to that if you're interested in, in that. That's free to access. The like is prescriptively frowned upon, so prescriptivists, especially older prescriptivists, get really, really annoyed with this kind of thing. Um, but actually what's interesting about like is that it's not just a marker of reported speech. It's actually a marker of reported thought as well. So let's take this second example. She was like, ah. Right. This does not mean that she said, ah. Right. What it means is that she was in some sort of mental state that could be approximated by the utterance, ah. Okay. So this is something that happens if, for instance, you're preparing for the exam, you might be like, ah. Right. But that doesn't mean that you're literally sitting there at your desk, like screaming. Right. You might be. I'm not judging, but most people don't, right? They just like internally panic. And that is one of the things that you can use this reported thought marker like for. So it's, a very, it's actually quite a functional feature of modern English if you're into that kind of thing. And this is not the only like in English. There is also the hesitation like. So there is also like the hesitation like that you can just insert into gaps like. Um, I don't really do that one so much, but I do sometimes. Um, most of the features that I claim not to use, I, you will eventually catch me using. And since it's being captured on video, uh, you literally have evidence. So, um, like is something that is very, very common, very prevalent, um, and very pervasive. And it's a very recent innovation. Really, during the last 50 years, this thing has come to prominence. OK, any questions about the syntactic developments? All right, so the lexicon. What's going on in the lexicon of modern English? Well, we have lots of new words. This is obvious. Some of these are words that you will recognize from various sources. Um, some of them may be new to you, worth looking up if you don't know them. A McMansion, for instance. Um, some of them are words that were probably cool when people started, when this book was written, but no one knows what they are anymore, like an e-bubble. I don't know what that is. Um, and uh, then, of course, there are words that come from the earlier part of this period, like Freudian and Jungian, which relate to Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung uh, specifically. Also, of course, many, many new technologies. And here, the technology itself drives the development of a word. You don't need a word for an atom bomb if you don't have an atom bomb. Or, not personally, but if the society that you're in does not have one. And many of these words are formed in interesting ways. Um, so you get abbreviations, acronyms, clippings, this kind of thing. And uh, here are some of those sources. Um, so this is, we're still in a period of the language where we borrow things. English has never stopped borrowing. So we still get new borrowings. We get jungle, we get angst, uh, we get broccoli, and so on and so forth. Um, we get new compounds. Um, so it's fairly clear where these things come from. Acid rain is pretty transparent. Glass ceiling, um, anyone know what that means? Obviously, it has a literal meaning, which is a ceiling that's made of glass. It also has a, uh, sort of meaning in the sort of feminist context of a, 
a threshold above which it is impossible to go as a woman, usually specifically, so that kind of glass ceiling. Um, in a job context, for instance. New derivations like postmodern, um, you get phrases being turned into words like hit and run. Um, you get new slang words being formed. Um, this is not so much a source of vocabulary, it is a type of vocabulary. Um, you get uh, retronyms, so these are where you sort of double part of the word, um, like a paper copy um, or a film camera. Um, acronyms, um, acronyms are thing, these things like um, SUVATM, LOL, or LOL. Um, acronyms in general, um, there, it's, it's, it's quite a, the, there is, you can distinguish between um, abbreviations and acronyms and initialisms, um, but for our purposes, we can just call them all uh, acronyms. Um, we get conversions, which is where you take one type of word, like a noun, and turn it into another kind of word, like a verb, to impact, from the noun impact, for instance, or a show off, from the verb showing off, which is where you've turned a verb into a noun. Sometimes said about the English language that any noun can be verbed. And then you've got clippings and mergers. Right? So decaf is a clipped form of decaffeinated. Motel is a merger. You've merged motor and hotel. Similarly, Brexit is when you merge Britain and exit. And uh, there are all kinds of exit-related uh, mergers that are coming out now when people talk about um, it would Greek leave the, the EU, then it would be Grexit, right? Um, if uh, France leaves the EU, it would be a Frexit, I guess. Um, if Germany were to leave the EU, I mean, I know that's not likely to happen, but interestingly, if it were, what would it be called? Jerksit? <laughs> Gerksit? Something like that. Uh, Germexit. I think is probably the best form you could hope for. Similarly with Italy, it gets tricky. People talk about Italexit, um, but it's not quite as, uh, as neat, right? Um, so, uh, many, many new words in the English language. And here are just some of them uh, to show that I'm up to date. Uh, not all of the history of English is from thousands of years ago, you know. Some of it I just looked up last week on the internet. So, here we've got the new words uh, for, from the Oxford English Dictionary from June 2019. Um, some of these words um, you might be familiar with, some of them you're not. Again, interesting to look up if you don't know them. Um, so, Brideshead, some of you might know the novel Brideshead Revisited, um, which is uh, by uh, E.M. Forster, quite a famous novel, um, basically about uh, Oxford and Cambridge and a particular type of culture that's developed there. And that's what this word Brideshead has come to refer to. Confirmation bias. Right? That's where you hear something and it supports the views that you already hold. Right? Um, gym bunny, um, I've given you a literal illustration of this, um, but a gym bunny is just someone who likes to spend a lot of time in the gym, right? not an actual rabbit, be careful with that. Um, a mail order bride is exactly what it says. Right? You, post, uh, you, you mail order a bride. And uh, the Twitter sphere is people on Twitter. Um, so these are all, some of these are old words that have been sort of, that have, that have only now been introduced to the Oxford English Dictionary. So confirmation bias, for instance. This has been around for a while. At least the individual parts of it have been around for a while. Bride's head has been around for a long while, but these words have only just made it into the dictionary. Some of them are genuinely new words and phrases like Twitter sphere, um, which can't have been around for any longer than Twitter has. So these are some of the new words of the period. And there are more all the time. OK, any questions about the lexicon? There's nothing hugely meaningful to be said about the lexicon, um, except that it keeps getting bigger. Uh, and one worries about this um, for the sort of, you know, will eventually the English lexicon become so huge that it devours all life on Earth? Um, but it doesn't seem likely to be the greatest existential threat that humanity faces in the near future, nevertheless. Okay, so what about these varieties then and the attitudes that people hold? Um, well, as I've said, this is the period of standardization. From early modern English onwards, we see standardization taking place, and part of that process is what I've called codification. Codification is when people write spelling, uh, when people write grammars, and when they write dictionaries. 
And so grammars start emerging. We saw some dictionaries before, um, and now we'll see, we'll talk more about dictionaries and things, um, but grammars start emerging really only during the modern period from 1700 onwards. So Samuel Johnson, who's up here, um, he's the famous Dr. Johnson, and his dictionary does include a grammar. Um, it's not a very long grammar. Um, Johnson, interestingly, Johnson is really trying to describe more than to prescribe, um, but his feelings sometimes get the better of him. Um, so he, for instance, notes that people use the verb to profound, as in, I profounded it. Um, and uh, Johnson says that this is a barbarous word. So Johnson doesn't really like this word, and he will make notes of this kind. Um, so Johnson's dictionary um, sometimes has some quite sort of judgmental parts. Sometimes it's quite witty and sarcastic as well. So you can't always take it all that seriously. Sometimes it's also not all that helpful. Two grammars that were much more widely influential during the period um, were um, Louth's grammar, a short introduction to English grammar, uh, Louth, sometimes known as Bishop Louth, um, is someone who, uh, who was very, very uh, famous for, for his grammar writing activities, uh, and now he is blamed, uh, perhaps unfairly, for being one of the founding fathers of English language prescriptivism. Um, it's really only prescriptive in the sense that it helps people to climb the social ladder. What Louth is trying to do with this book is not to say everyone should speak and write the same way. He's saying, look, I've realized there's a market out there for people who want to improve their lot in life, people who want to be social climbers, people who want to improve their own social standing uh, by knowing how to talk to wealthy, posh people. And he says, if you want to do that, then this is how to do it. He's not saying this is what everyone should do. He's saying, if you want to climb the social ladder, this is how you can do it, by using these particular pronunciations, forms, uh, syntactic structures, etc. Murray, uh, Louth, interestingly, even though Louth himself was arguably not as prescriptivist as been traditionally claimed, um, his follower, Lindley Murray, was, and that's him down here. Um, Lindley Murray um, writes an English grammar in, uh, in 1795. I should put rights in scare quotes because actually uh, Lindley Murray's English grammar is basically just loads of stuff copied out of Louth's grammar. So copyright wasn't so much of a big deal in the 18th century, and Louth basically just rips, uh, Murray basically just rips off Louth really, really extensively. He takes loads of stuff, and when Louth makes a more nuanced comment, like, if you want to speak in the high register, you need to do this, Murray will just be a lot more categorical. He'll say, you need to do this, right? Punked. Right? Doesn't get any more uh, prescriptive than that. So, um, Louth's, uh, Murray's grammar, and through him, Louth, uh, has a great influence from the end of the 18th century onwards. What about dictionaries, then? Well, what we saw in the early modern period was that there were dictionaries, but they were mostly lists of words that were hard. Right? So these were things for foreigners or for people, again, who were trying to improve their social status. Um, these words were mostly just lists of words, literally. They didn't actually contain definitions. The first one that does contain definitions um, is John Kersey's New English Dictionary of 1702. But some of these definitions are not really up to scratch. So, for instance, the word goat in this dictionary is just described as a beast. If you don't know what a goat is, and you look it up in the dictionary, and this is all you get, you are not likely to be much wiser after having read this definition. So John Kersey's New English Dictionary was not hugely useful. Um, we've got 28,000 words here. In 1721, Nathan Bailey um, publishes a universal etymological English dictionary, which contains some information about the history of these words. And um, this dictionary is 40,000 words long, which is about the same length as the much more famous later dictionary of Dr. Johnson, um, which was, like I said, similarly 40,000 words. Um, what Johnson does that earlier dictionary writers don't do is that he gives examples. So he gives an examples from a, a specific range of authors. Uh, he says, here's someone actually using this word in context. Um, but he's also, again, like I say, very judgmental and sometimes... 
uh, about a bit personal with his definitions. So a patron, for instance, um, a patron is defined in his dictionary, or the, the, at the end of the definition it says, commonly a wretch who supports with insolence and is paid with flattery. From this, we can infer that Johnson had a patron who he did not like very much. Right? And this is indeed true. Lord Chesterfield, Johnson's patron, was notoriously unreliable. Um, nevertheless, we might say it would have been better if Johnson hadn't been influenced by his personal prejudices when compiling his dictionary. But there we go. We worked with what we had in the 18th century. I don't know why I'm implying I was alive in the 18th century. I totally wasn't. Um, what about today, then? Well, prescriptivism is still alive and well. Uh, figures like uh, Edwin Newman, William Sapphire in the 20th century in, in the US um, have, have made prescriptivism uh, very popular. In the UK, we have people like Lynn Truss, a very famous book, um, Turn of the Millennium, called Eats, Shoots and Leaves, about grammar and punctuation. Um, John Humphreys, uh, who is a uh, radio presenter, um, he's best known um, for being very... Uh, being a very aggressive interviewer and interviewing politicians uh, and not letting them get away with things, but he's also got a line in telling other people how to use language properly, even though he has no qualifications to do so whatsoever. And Neville Gwynne is a more recent prescriptivist who also um, takes this line of, there is a good and right and proper way to speak and to, to write English. Now, since a lot of you here will become teachers of English, you will need to think about these issues long and hard. Because if linguistics teaches you nothing else, it should teach you that there's nothing inherently better about to whom did you give the book than there is with who did you give the book to. Right? These, there's nothing wrong with the latter form. It's just that prescriptivists, for some reason, like one of these forms and don't like the other one. So prescriptivism is, to a certain extent, arbitrary. It's almost always arbitrary, in fact. Sometimes it's based on demonstrable historical inaccuracy. As we saw with the preposition stranding last week, this is literally just a rule that someone made up in the 17th century. It has no bearing, no relation to linguistic reality in history. So what do you then do? Because on the one hand, you know that this prescriptivism is a load of nonsense. On the other hand, you still have to teach your English students something, right? And you have to decide exactly what. And you have different options here. One of them, I think, is to teach your pupils a standard variety. And when I say a standard variety, remember there is not just one for English, right? Um, you can teach them a more American or a more British flavor of standard English. At school level, it probably doesn't matter hugely much which you teach them, but there are differences. If you do that, it's still important, I think, for everyone to be aware um, that these varieties are not better linguistically, right? They are maybe more prestigious socially, but they're not actually better in terms of communication, in terms of functionality, or anything like that. Another option, and these are not mutually exclusive, is to actually give your students an awareness of the kind of different varieties that are out there. Teach them about things like preposition stranding. Teach them about things like ain't. Teach them about the kind of linguistic features that they will encounter in their daily lives and that they will need to communicate in English but teach them that these varieties, some of them are prestigious and some of them aren't. And that's your other option, really. Either way, I think it's very important to acknowledge two things. First of all, prescriptivism is incredibly prevalent. Right? So you will, your students will be, in count, will be faced with prescriptive attitudes at some point uh, in future. Uh, and these, these attitudes are powerful. If you go to a job interview in Britain and you go into it speaking a Yorkshire accent, even if you're the best candidate on the list, people might still judge you, whether consciously or subconsciously, for not speaking quote-unquote proper English, even if you're completely comprehensible. So prescriptive attitudes are out there. There's no denying that. Um, but it's also important to acknowledge that prescriptivism is mostly based on nonsense. Right? It's mostly 
based on, like I said, people being very creative about the history of their own language, making things up. And essentially, prescriptivism in most of its forms is just prejudice. It's just another form of discrimination, um, it's except on linguistic grounds rather than on the grounds of, say, skin colour and gender. It's no accident, of course, that the varieties that become the standard, remember we talked about selection and acceptance last time, the varieties that become the standard language, and this is not just true for English, it's true everywhere, the varieties that become the standard are always, always, always the languages of the people in power. Right? They're never the language of the little guy or the little girl. See, not being sexist. So prescriptivism, so linguistic history is determined as much by, in terms of what becomes prestigious, what becomes standard, is determined much more by essentially socio-historical and cultural accident than it is by any kind of function or meaning. Uh, and, and it's important to bear that in mind. So you need to be careful uh, when you're teaching pupils. You need to think about what your line on prescriptivism is going to be, how you're going to treat it personally, uh, if and when you become a teacher. But you don't have to think about that for a while, mostly. Most of you still have to get through uh, several years of university and uh, pass a really long oral exam. Uh, so maybe think about that in your spare time. Dialects, then. So here are the basic dialect divisions in England. This is a simplified version. You can see the textbook for the full version. The main divide, as always, is north versus south. Um, so you can see this line here um, is probably the major dialect division in England. And there are many, many linguistic features that set us apart the north from the south. Um, so for instance, words like bath and grass in my variety would be an ah, and in the north, people would pronounce these bath and grass with an ah vowel in British English. Um, similarly, um, in the south, you have words like up, but, and duck, as in my variety. In the north, you'll get things like up, but, and duck. And uh, this, these are very prevalent features, right? Some of the features I've talked about on earlier slides are recessive. They're things that you wouldn't actually hear unless you went looking for them. These ones, these vowels, are everywhere. They're really super, super prevalent. And as soon as you start moving about in the UK, you will realize that these things are all over the place. You can be more specific. You can actually look and try and, and pin things down more closely. Um, but for now, uh, the main focus is on uh, the north versus the south. And it's also worth pointing out that this is a major political and cultural divide as well as a linguistic one. Um, so Elizabeth Gaskell um, in the 19th century wrote a novel, North and South, which is partly about these tensions, about this division uh, between northerners and southerners. And uh, in present day England, the north-south divide um, is important politically in that, for instance, on the whole, northern voters are quite a lot more likely to vote for the Labour Party rather than the Conservative Party, though again, it depends on the precise location. Northern voters are, or northern, northern people are also, um, on the whole, the northern cities are less well funded. Um, they are, uh, though this is changing to a certain extent, um, but the big political and economic and educational centres of Britain are in the south. Um, so you've got London down here, up here you've got Cambridge, Oxford is somewhere here. This is called the Golden Triangle. Right? This is where a lot of the money and power and uh, prestige is centred uh, in Britain today. So that distinction is is quite important. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly rough thing. Um, there are areas of the, of the east here and of the southwest that are also not super wealthy either. But on the whole, this is very often conceptualized in terms of England, north versus south. So it's worth knowing about this distinction, even if just on those grounds. If you want to find out more about the dialect variation, um, you can look at this uh, website here, which gives you a lot of different dialect features, not just phonological ones, also words like, if you have a little uh, Brötchen, what word do you use for this Brötchen? 
right? In Germany, we know this varies. You have, whether it's a Semmel or a Seele or a, or a whatever. Um, here, um, well, Seele is a different thing, but never mind. Okay. Um, see, my bread vocabulary is extremely, extremely bad. When I go into bakeries, I just have to point at things. Um, like, yeah, das da. Mm. Um, so, um, but in, in England also it's crazy, and you get baps, you get cobs, you get muffins, you get tea cakes, you get rolls, and they all refer to the same thing, it just depends where in the country you came from. So go and look that up if you're interested. Um, oh, here's something different, how much time do I have left? So, so far I've just been focusing on England, basically, and one thing that, uh, that I mentioned at the start, that I mentioned last week too, is that this is the period when English becomes widespread. English has already spread across the world in the later part of the early modern English period, and during the late modern English period from 1700s onwards, it entrenches itself in different places of the world. Um, so first of all, in the Americas, from 1607 onwards, there are stable colonies in the North American area, and from 1627 in the Caribbean as well. These are very early colonial settlements uh, of the British Empire. Um, India is also settled very, very early, colonized very, very early. From 1612 onwards, um, you get a robust British presence in this area. Um, from uh, in 1670s onwards, West Africa sees British influence. Um, this part, um, they are more interested, for the most part, in getting slaves from there than they are in actually colonizing it per se, uh, but there is that too. Uh, down here, we, f we see um, in the southern hemisphere, um, Australia being settled from the 1780s onwards, um, New Zealand from the 1830s, and South Africa um, from 1806 uh, is under British influence. So England is spreading uh, all around the world, and um, ah, I, didn't, I didn't include this map. Um, if you go online, if you search for um, map of countries that have never been attacked by Britain, there's a very nice map of the around about 20, I think, countries in the entire world that have never been either attacked or colonized by Britain at some point in its history. Um, Britain has done a fairly good job. I mean, some of them are places that didn't exist at the relevant period. So Vatican City, for instance, um, has never been attacked by Britain. Um, although sometimes I think maybe I ought to just go there and change that. But um, anyway, um, what I ought to be talking about is Kahuru's three circles model of English. Um, usually we have a varieties of English module at some stage in the course of your uh, of your studies here that you can take and you can, develop, you can delve into this in a lot more detail because there's so much more to say about different varieties of English around the world than I can say in 15 minutes in this lecture. Um, broadly speaking, this model is a kind of historical representation of the different varieties of English and how they got where they are. Um, so you've got an inner circle in this model and the inner circle countries in Kakaru's model um, are the places where Basically, English has either always been spoken, in the case of the United Kingdom, and I say always, but even that we need to take with a pinch of salt, because remember, before the 5th century, there wasn't any English there either. Um, we've got places like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Anglophone Canada and South Africa, and some of the Caribbean territories. So the places that were the, basically the first diaspora, the places that I showed you on the previous map, as having been settled um, early uh, by England, or at least most of them. Um, these are places where English is spoken widely as an L1, and it's a norm setting, these are the norm setting countries, right? If you learn English, you're gonna learn English as it's spoken in one of these countries, probably United Kingdom or, New, or the United States, maybe Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Canada, less likely South Africa or the Caribbean, but potentially still. You're not likely to learn, let's say, Indian English or Singaporean English. And these are the countries that have been described as the second diaspora. So uh, the second wave of British settlement 
uh, was in these areas. And what sets apart English in these countries is that even though it's not actually the first language of most of the population, it has played an important role in the history of the country and it has played an important role in government. Um, so these outer circle countries include many African and Asian countries. Um, India would be an example here. Um, also the West African countries I talked about before um, where uh, England has been settled and, and Singapore, as I've said. There is also an expanding circle and the expanding circle is where we are right now, right? Because I'm here talking English to you and you're here learning it. And that means that you're part of an expanding circle uh, where English is becoming more and more widely used, arguably, in certain functions, in certain contexts. What we're not talking about here is a diaspora or a colonial context. So that's the big difference, right? Um, Germany was never a colony of Britain. And as a result, um, the status of the language is quite different. Even though English is used as a lingua franca, it hasn't historically had this privileged government role like it has in places like India. So here's a brief case study. This is American English, and this is some of the historical developments that you can see. Um, Algeo, if you want to find out more about this, uh, here's the reference, it's given at the end too. Algeo divides this into the colonial period, which is the period up until independence, when the British crown is still at least nominally in control. Um, the first permanent colony was founded in 1607. This was Jamestown, Virginia. Um, and of course, the fact that you couldn't just nip over to see your family every week if you lived in America meant that the sheer physical distance fostered a new variety. Just as much, much earlier, um, the, uh, the, uh, the distance between uh, Britain and the continent had fostered a new variety of Germanic to be developed. Okay. During the national period, um, we see... Uh, a greater cultural independence. We see more self-awareness. People are developing, uh, and like I said, with Webster's Dictionary coming out, Americans start to think, we're not just speaking the language of the British crown, we've got our own thing going on, and we're going to treat it as such. And then from 1898 onwards, we see what's called the international period of American English. Um, this is the point at which the whole of the US is settled, and we see new markets being needed. So this is when essentially the start of the period in which the US becomes the world's major dominant economic and military power, the world's only superpower as it's sometimes been described in recent years. Um, so uh, those are the three periods into which the, uh, the history of the language is, is divided. If you want to find more about the history and the features of American English, um, you can re read uh, Algeo's text. Okay, um, I won't read out this summary. There's a whole lot of, going, of stuff going on here. Uh, what's crucial is that attitudes to language are being sharpened. The modern attitude towards good English, bad English, what's the kind of English that you should teach to your school pupils, what's the kind of English that you shouldn't teach to your school pupils, this is the kind of stuff that is developing from 1700 onwards. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. So, a couple of things for you to do. First, have a look at those dialect maps that I mentioned. Take a, a browse there, pick a feature of your choice, see how it's used. Um, and then take a look at this text by Isaac Newton uh, to find out about the linguistic features. Obviously, this will not pose any problems of understanding, or at least it shouldn't. Um, and so what I want you to look for is the linguistic differences. So anything that you can spot that sets this text apart from how a modern English text would be written today. Uh, and your job, other than that, um, is just to go to the tutorial, do some reading. Next time round, no new material. We're just going to bring everything together in an overview. So that's it for today. <laughs>